So now we will get into the weaponry part of this. There is a lot of similarities between aircraft and helicopter weapon controls. Uh, there are some things that aircraft use that helicopters don't, like missile control X and Y axis. I'll go over all that stuff. But for the most part, everything's pretty similar. So starting at the very top, we have small caliber guns, large caliber guns, and additional guns. The differences between these are small caliber guns are things like 7.62s, large calibers are anything that's, well, they're typically um, anything bigger than 7.62, but some planes, the small calibers, the 12 millimeters, and the larger caliber is like the 20 or the 30 millimeters. It depends. Uh, additional guns yeah, are gun pods, so anything mounted externally onto the plane or helicopter is an additional gun. As far as I know, all helicopters, uh, small and large caliber are the same, but obviously for planes, there's a ton of planes uh, that have small, large, and additional guns. Then this fire machine guns slash cannons. So this is actually an axis, and the way this works is you can have it set to... I don't know if I'll be able to show it here, but I'll try it with the Xbox controller. So I'm going to use the trigger because the trigger on this is a binary input, not a um, not a variable input. Hold it down a little bit, it fires the main gun. If I hold, down, if I hold it down all the way, it fires additional guns. So the way that axis works is if you don't want to have a bunch of different buttons bound to all these, but you still want to fire your guns somewhat separately, you can bind the fire machine gun slash cannons to a trigger and uh, whenever you hold it down just a little bit it'll fire the smaller guns or the main gun and like in this case it's the cannon and then if you hold it down all the way it'll file fire additional guns or large calibers so next we have fire primary weapons and fire secondary weapons for helicopters you don't need these key bindings but if you prefer this then by all means you will actually need this key binding for some planes like the Phantom because it uses two air-to-air -air missiles. It uses the Sparrows and it uses the Sidewinders. And if you want to use them both at the same time, you will have to use that key binding if you want to switch between them. Now to switch it, I'm going to skip over a couple key bindings. To switch it, you're going to want to switch primary weapons and switch secondary weapons. And if you want to not use the game, if you want to like use both the weapon selector and not use the weapon selector, you will want to bind the exit weapon selector mode somewhere. You also have secondary weapon ripple quantity. What this does, and I don't remember where I found, okay, that's right now. So you'll notice every time I'm pressing, or at least I'm pressing the key binding, but you don't know what the key binding is. I haven't told you yet. But if, I, if you see me pressing it, you'll notice a number shows up next to the rocket right here. This tells the uh, weapon selector how many rockets to fire at once. You'll notice I can set it up to 16. I really want to. And I can fire 16 rockets at once, which is kind of like a, a shotgun at this point. Um, and since the rockets kind of have like a decently inaccurate trajectory at long range, it actually might be pretty useful instead of firing rockets in a series. But I don't really use it, so it's up to you. Now, if when I do use it for airplanes, the way I have it bound is I have fire primary weapons uh, set to the same key binding that I use for my guns, which is the trigger, and fire secondary weapons I put with my rockets, which is this big black button on the side. I don't prefer this one just because it's really squishy, so I use the big red button. Um, I use the big red button in combination with modifier 1 and 2 to exit the weapon selector, and I use modifier 1 and 2 to switch uh, the primary and secondary weapons. And for ripple quantity, um, I don't really use it that much, or at all, so I just bound it to something really weird, like 1 and 2 plus start, because I don't, I don't use that. So drop bomb, pretty self-explanatory. Um, helicopters can carry some bombs. I think the H-34 can carry like 10 bombs or something like that. So drop bomb and drop bomb series, uh, if you're using bombs, obviously you'll want to use the drop bomb button. But you, you don't really need drop bomb series bound to anything. It's kind of pointless. The Russian helicopters can carry four bombs maximum, and they drop two at a time. So the most you'd have to mash the button is twice. So you, there's really no point to buying drop bomb series unless you're using the French H-34 and 
you're going to try carpet bombing with 50, 50 uh, kilogram bombs. But for airplanes, obviously, you'll, you'll probably want to bind drop bomb to something. Uh, we have fire rockets and fire rocket salvo. Fire rocket salvo and fire rocket series, they're the same thing. Um, so the way I have my controls bound real quick for weaponry, I have my trigger, which is for firing guns. I have this big black button, which I use for firing rockets. This big red button is for bombs. And these, this button on the side, I use for air-to-air -air missiles and air-to-ground missiles. Now, you can use the weapon selector if you really don't want to have all the buttons on here be dedicated to firing weapons. Like, I know, like, real-life helicopters, I believe, like, some of the trim controls are on the flight stick, or maybe they're on the collective. I don't remember. But if you want to have it more immersive, you may not want to do it that way. You may just want to stick with the weapon selector. Because that's historically, I guess, how some helicopters would select their weapons. They had, like, a little panel where they would switch between guns or rockets or 40 mils, and they'd, they'd switch how many rockets fire at once. So, up to you to decide how you want to do that, but for me personally, I like having everything to a separate button so I don't have to worry about cycling in the middle of combat. Next up, we probably have the more complicated weapon system to understand, and that is the weapon lock for air-to-air -air and air-to-ground missiles. I do not know how weapon lock air-to-ground missiles work. I think these are for the walleyes or the mavericks or something. I, I don't know. Um, but for air-to-air -air missiles, it's for anything like sidewinders, stingers, R60s. And the way it works is you press this button on the side, or you you press the weapon lock button first, and then once it is uh, locked on to a target, you can then fire the weapon, which you will see down here, fire air to ground and fire air to air missile. Now I have all of these bound to this button, and it's a different combination of button one, two, and both one and two at the same time. Pressing it turns on the air-to-air -air missile seeker. Pressing one in that, uh, the side button, fires the air-to-air -air once it gets locked. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's it's in my diagrams. You can see you can see it all there if you want. But we're gonna try to lock onto this MiG with a Stinger missile. We'll notice there is a green circle there. And when that green circle goes over the target, it locks onto it. And we can fire the missile. Now, air-to-air -air missiles aren't that great. I'm not going to go into detail about which missiles are better than others, but you can uh, every plane, every helicopter, the seeker, the where the seeker is, is different. Sometimes the seeker might be below the site, sometimes it might be above it, sometimes it's smack dab in the middle. So make sure you know before you go into like a simulator mode where that seeker locks on from and where the missile launches on from. You'll notice. I locked onto it down here, but the missile fired, like, up here. So, you want to make sure if you're going to fire at something uh, with the missile, like a uh, Stinger missile, or a uh, Sidewinder, like a very old Sidewinder, like an AIM-9B, make sure that once you lock on, that the starting trajectory of that missile is where you want it to be, because if it's too, if it's too much off, it is going to miss the target entirely. Now, while you have to lock on to a target before you can fire air-to-air -air missiles, most air-to-ground missiles do not require a lock-on to be fired. I don't know of a single air-to-ground missile that requires a lock-on again, other than like maybe the Walleyes or the Mavericks. I don't know. I haven't used them before. But things like Hellfires, you can fire them without requiring a lock. As you can see, just fired that Hellfire missile, and it went straight for that ZSU-37 when I locked on to it. But some... Um, Every air-to-ground missile has its own uh, tracking or its own guidance system. It's different for each uh, each missile. Tow missiles are wire-guided. Um, some missiles, like the Hellfire, they're laser-guided. So you have to find out which one... Um, you have to find out how they work because some of these key bindings, for example, there is toggle laser designator on and off. If I were to fire this Hellfire missile at this tank, and turn off the laser designator, which is... which button? God, I, I, I rarely turn it on and off. So if I press 9 and 12, turn off the laser designator, the Hellfire missile doesn't know what to do. 
It just, uh, it probably, I don't know what it does, it may be continuing its last known path, but you have to make sure that if you're using weapons that require a laser designator, that you don't turn it off in the middle of the flying. Now, funny thing about the laser designator is you can actually annoy the shit out of some tanks with it, because uh, at top tier, most tanks have a laser warning receiver. So if you're hovering over a tank with the laser designator, they're going to know that someone's targeting them with a laser. And you don't have to have any weapons to do this. You can kind of like suppressing fire in a way. Um, I mean, eventually they'll realize that nothing's happening to them. But if you shine a laser at them, they're, they're going to think they're either being locked on by Hellfire missiles, or I think maybe Vickerud missiles, or there's a tank trying to sight in on them to range them. And this is going to cause them to be a lot more cautious. So that's one thing you can do with helicopters. Um, you can use that key binding in a cheeky way. Now, I do not know how guided bombs work, as I have not had a chance to use them. So I can't tell you how lock guided bombs works or drop guided bombs works. I'll tell you right now, I don't know of any helicopters that use guided bombs, so you don't need to worry about that at all. For planes, though, a lot of the top tier planes use guided bombs. So if you want to know more about those, uh, find someone else because I have no idea and I don't have any guided bomb planes to play with. And now we get into countermeasures. So there's many different kinds of countermeasures for helicopters. You have some simple ones that are passive countermeasures, like for example, these uh, objects on the side of the hind. They're there to kind of disperse the heat from the exhaust. You can see I can take it off. Oh, no. I can take it on or I can take it off just like that. You also noticed I have flares and chaff. Now flares, uh, something that people don't realize is flares deploy from a specific location on the helicopter. Where it is, is different for every helicopter. I am not entirely sure, but I believe these are the flares for the hind. Quick, if I unequip it. Yeah, you can see that it disappears. So for the hind, it's on the sides of the chassis. For things like the H1Z, it's actually in these panels right here. I don't know if they'll disappear. Panels are still there. But that's where the flares will deploy from. The Apache, uh, it has some on the back here. But you can also equip this missile approach warning system on the side. And it'll have flares dispense from this. Another type of countermeasure that you will have on some helicopters is this. It is an, I don't, it's an optical electric station. Uh, I have no clue what it is, but it's supposed to help. Uh, it's well, it's supposed to help you by making it harder for the enemy to lock on with infrared missiles. You'll notice it on some helicopters. There's going to be this like siren looking or this like little this little light on top. That's what it is. And for the most part, that's what all helicopter countermeasures are. The way flares and chaff work is flares will make it to where if a infrared missile is flying towards you, the flares, if used appropriately, will they won't draw the attention away from your helicopter. But you kind of want to use it as like a cloak. You want to cover your helicopter with these flares so that your exhaust or the heat source that it's locking onto is hidden behind the flares so that when you finally move, the missile is going to where the flares are because that's where you were and it's thinking those flares are now you. So you got to make sure when you deploy flares that you put the flares in between your helicopter and the missile. If you just deploy the flares, like if you're flying this way and there's a missile coming at you from your front and you deploy flares, well, the flares are going to pop out and go out this way. They're, you're putting yourself in between the flares and the missile. You want to put the flares in between the missile and the helicopter. So, for example, if you're flying this way and a missile's coming at you, you want to turn around, pop the flares, and then fly away. That way the missile will go for the flares because that's what is in between you and the helicopter. Or the, the, the missile and the helicopter. Now, chaff is what you use when you want to try to break a radar lock. When you are using chaff, this is what you'd want to use if someone's locking onto you with a sparrow. Uh, or if they are using... A gun SPAA that is radar guided, you could use chaff to kind of break that radar lock and make it harder for people to track you. 
Now, most top tier missiles for anti-air are optically guided or infrared guided. I don't know of any that are radar guided. So make sure if you're going to uh, use chaff that you know that's not going to work on those missiles. Now, as for which ones you should take is entirely up to you. My rule of thumb is if it can carry only 30, if I can only carry like a certain amount of countermeasures like 30, it's best to only carry flares because you're not really going to, you're going to need to pop a lot of flares if you want to break a missile lock, say, uh, reliably. You're probably going to use all of them or at least half just to break off one missile. Now, if you have a missile approach warning system like the Apache here does, you'll have like an extra 120 on top of the 30 flares that you had. So you could definitely take both. For countermeasures, I recommend putting these somewhere where you always have your hands on them because when you do need to deploy countermeasures, you're going to need to deploy them immediately. You cannot hesitate. At least this is the case for helicopters. With planes, you may have a little bit more time because missiles take a lot longer to reach a plane when they are chasing them. But for helicopters, I would just not worry about binding fire countermeasures and just bind fire countermeasures series to a button. For me, I pick this button right here since the palm of my hand is always on it. And for aircraft, I would actually bind fire countermeasures to this and fire countermeasure series uh, a little different. Actually, I don't even think you can fire countermeasures in a series for aircraft, so you don't even have to worry about that. But for helicopters, don't worry about fire countermeasures. Just put fire countermeasure series here because you're going to need to deploy a lot of them if you want to break a air-to-air -air missile that is infrared guided. Fire uh, periodic countermeasures release on and off. What this does is it will pop out flares every so often. You can set how often it will pop flares and or chaff at the start menu, or I guess the spawn menu. This is good if you are going in somewhere, you know, if you're about to expose yourself and you don't want someone to lock onto you, this is when you'd want to pop this, because when you pop this, it's going to be hard for someone to lock on with an infrared missile. If you've ever tried to lock onto someone after they just deployed flares, the infrared missile just will not lock onto them. I don't know if that's how it is in real life, but in War Thunder, that's how it is. Um, and as for chaff, I don't know if it makes it hard for radar to lock onto you. But if someone's in a gun SPAA and they use radar to uh, to lead the shot, um, that would po possibly help make it hard for people to do that. So you want to turn on or use periodic countermeasures when you are about to do an attack run or if you're exiting an attack run and you feel like people are going to try to shoot at you with some deadly weapons. Countermeasures sla uh, slaving to maw on and off. Not every helicopter has a MAW, which is a Missile Approach Warning System. The H-1Z does. I cannot show you how the MAW works right now, because I can't have... I, I don't know of a way to make someone shoot missiles at. But every single helicopter that has a MAW has a uh, an MFD that lets you display this, which is the Radar Warning screen, but it's also the Missile Approach Warning screen. When someone is shooting a missile at you, it will show up here. A missile will show up um, somewhere along this ring, like a clock. You know, you have your 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, your 6 o'clock. It'll show up where the missile's coming from relative to your helicopter, and it'll make a siren noise. And if you bind, or if you turn on the countermeasure slaving the maw, it'll deploy flares and chaff automatically. But if you turn it off, it won't. Now, why would you want to do this? Well, a lot of times people will shoot missiles at you that are not infrared seeking or they're not radar guided. So deploying flares and chaff would be useless and a waste. And you can only carry so many of them. So this is a uh, example of when you'd want to use it. If you have K K-50s shooting thicker missiles at you, you'd want to turn off the slaving to mob because you're just wasting your flares. So when someone actually does shoot an IR missile at you, um, you'll actually be able to defeat that. Switch infrared countermeasures on and off. So this one is... This one turns off all those passive countermeasures that I mentioned earlier, like the uh, optically whatever the hell that was on the Apache. I believe it also turns off the missile approach warning. Oh, and forgot to mention, 
everything is bound to this button and the combination of my modifier button one and two. I'm not going to go over radar in this video because then it would be way too long. Plus, uh, I think radar just kind of deserves its own video. Drop guided bombs, you don't need that for helicopters. For planes, I guess you, you do need it. But in this case, I would probably just use the weapon selector. That's just, for me, that's even way too many key bindings. Next up, we have yaw axis and pitch axis framed weapons. These are for things like Mavericks. I believe this might also be for those radar guided bombs that the Germans have for those World War II bombers. I could be wrong, I haven't used them. But anything that would require aiming with some sort of directional pad, that's what you want to have bound for it. And I bind this to the hat switch. I also have my view controls bound to the hat switch, but because I'm in VR, I don't use the, v the view controls. My my view does not change. It's not something that I have to worry about. But if you're only going to use a HOTAS and you're not using VR and you're not using head tracking and you plan on using this hat switch for viewing, the way you're going to use this while also still not looking around, because obviously if you're aiming your weapon and also turning your head at the same time, it's going to be really hard to keep your eyes on the target. So what I have is I have a, a button here on the side. I'll go over my view controls later, but I have a button here, reset axis values button 5 I hold this button down and it keeps my head pointing forward so that I can guide my weapons without moving my camera so I will quickly show you that it could take me a while to get to that anti air but you can see looking around and if I hold the button down I mean the camera does jiggle around a little bit but I'm still I got my eyes forward so now we're going to try to take out that anti air pretty far away I'm probably not going to hit him but you can at least see the missile fly. So we're gonna launch the missile right there. There it goes. And I can move it right, move it left, up. It's now going off in a trajectory that I do not know because I uh, kind of lost track of it. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's roughly how you want to use the yawn pitch axis for aim weapons. And just because I forgot to show y'all, this is what my axes are. It's nothing crazy. It's about the same that I have for all, everything else. I do recommend um, inverting the pitch axis, though. For aircraft, we have a key binding called Schrager Music, or Schrager Music. I, I'm not German, so I can't pronounce it correctly. But what this is, it's available for some planes that have guns not just mounted in the front, but they have guns mounted on the back or the top and they are pointing up into the sky. And what this does is it allows you to toggle between them. So you can see this is a Japanese plane with some auto cannons right about here. And they're aiming where that dot is. And to activate that dot, you press the Traeger Music button. Next up, we have the Toggle Cannon Ballistic Computer and the Toggle Rocket Ballistic Computer. Now, the way this works is I have them both off right now. But it only works in third... This is a key binding that only works in third person. In cockpit, you can't see it. Or I guess it also works in virtual cockpit. But you'll see here, I have my, my gun sight, which is here. And my rocket sight, which is there. If I press the ballistic computer button, it doesn't really show up uh, until you actually point it around. But for guns, you'll see now it's kind of it has a extra X in the crosshair. And for rockets, it has a X on the ground. Other rockets are going to land. If you want to use this in the cockpit, you have to use the switch sight mode in cockpit key binding which I have bound to the seven. And at the bottom, it'll tell you exactly what uh, your sight mode is set to. You have the standard sight mode. Um, and by the way, this is different. Every, um, every plane, every helicopter has different sets of these. You have the standard one, which is, I guess, typically just the, the standard sight. It's just pointed forward, like where your nose is pointing, where your guns are sighted in. You have the sight, uh, the tracking the cannon on the ground. So if you're trying to shoot at ground targets, it'll tell you where your bullets are going to land relative to how you're flying. You have one for rockets. You'll have some for bombs. 
And that's pretty much it. I can't show you the bomb one right now, but I can show you the uh, guns and the rockets. So this is the standard one. If I press it again, it goes to a cannon on the ground target, which you can kind of see as soon as I get to the water. You have rockets, same thing as cannons on ground, except it tells you where the rockets will land. Although, I'll be honest, rockets and planes uh, like this uh, typically don't work out that well. But I'll show you here. That's basically how you'd want to use the stuff. So, they're good key bindings to have if you're in sin and you like to ground pound. Or if you're, um, if you just like cockpit, you don't have to play in sim. Switch mission bombing target, um, is, uh, I don't really know how to use it. I know it's something when you, when you're taking off from the airfield, you press this key binding, and it's supposed, the way it's supposed to work is you fly towards a target, and it drops your bombs automatically. I'd recommend looking this up because I don't know exactly how to use it. Um, but that's, I believe, how switch mission uh, bombing target works. And then these is where you activate and deactivate the um, target. Lastly, for aircraft, we have site stabilization and site destabilization. I don't have any aircraft that can use these key bindings access, so I'll have to show you with helicopters. But it's essentially the same thing. You can activate the site stabilizer inside the pilot seat, and it'll lock on wherever your nose is pointing. If you're in some helicopters like the H1Z or the Apache, it'll keep locked on to wherever you put the sight. But you can disable it, and it'll you'll notice it down here. It'll destabilize it. Now, you cannot move and aim within the cockpit, which is kind of annoying and sad, but uh, you can activate and deactivate the stabilizer from in the cockpit. If you're not in the cockpit, though, you can do the same thing from inside the ATGM view. If you hover over a vehicle and you're in a helicopter that has the ability to do this, because not everyone does, you can lock onto the target and it'll put a box around it and track it. Perfect. But um, sometimes, uh, if you want to kind of change your shot up a little bit, you can press the stabilizer again, and now it will put a circle around it, but it'll still be locked on to the vehicle. It's kind of interesting. Um, you don't really need to use this feature, but it is there if you want to use it. Uh, what I actually use it for is whenever I'm locking on to a group of tanks, and it kind of selects both of them. I'll see if I can show you here. I'm trying to lock on to one of these trucks, but it's locking on to both of them at the same time. They, they think both of these trucks are one. So, this is when you want to press the stabilizer again to do the circle so you can aim more accurately at the vehicle you are trying to target. And lastly, for helicopters, we have change rate of fire. Now, not every gun can have a different rate of fire, but you'll see right here, it'll tell you what the rate of fire is, and for certain systems, like these 7.62 uh, gun pods, you change the rate of fire, which you can see, the, the sound doesn't change sometimes, but you can see the tracer fire is a lot uh, more spaced out because of the lower rate of fire. A quick recap of all my controls. I have my guns set to trigger. I have my bombs set to the big red button, button number two. Rockets, button number four. Missiles, both air to ground and air to air missiles are this button. And the different combinations of these buttons with buttons, modifier buttons 1 and 2 that I have on the throttle, is how I use all of those. I do not have anything bound to modifier button 1 and uh, the trigger, because I use that combination a lot. And I didn't want anything there to override uh, my guns. My hat switch is what I use for aiming weapons. Um, and countermeasures, I use this button here for my palm, and again, modifier buttons 1 and 2, with, uh, in addition to the uh, countermeasures button to mess with the missile approach warning system, like periodic flares. So, hopefully that helps you all understand my control scheme. The next video I will do be on camera controls. So, stay tuned for that.